Okay. Why don't we get started? Um, welcome everybody to the first Jacob CRLT speaker of the new year, and I'm happy to see such a lovely crowd, even though nobody wants to sit up front um, where they've got a table and stuff. But um, I am so delighted to have um, Professor John Wei Zhang here to give our talk today. I met John Wei when he was a graduate student at Beijing Normal University and I was a first year assistant professor, actually a first semester assistant professor. And I presented a, at a conference in Beijing and Rutgers had something going on with Beijing Normal. I'm not sure either of us really understood that. But, um, John Wei showed me around the Forbidden City and we've been friends ever since. And now we were talking last evening and realizing it's been like 22 years. Mm -hmm. Um, John Way is an associate professor at State University of New York at Woo. Albany <laughs> and is an associate editor of Journal of the Learning Sciences and when I was editor he was one of my go-to reliable, thoughtful, dependable, um, speedy reviewers <laughs> um, for which th there's just so many things I'm grateful for. Um, after graduating, um, and I, I have very little of that on my crib sheet, that's just your interest, uh, John Wei taught in China for a bit and then did a postdoc with um, Marlene Scardamalia and Carl Breida, Breida at Boise and, and um, began doing work on knowledge building. And that's been a consistent thread of his research um, over the last many years. Um, he studies technology and teaching innovations in the information age. His research explores technology-enabled learning designs to engage students in sustained, creative knowledge work across content areas and school years in order to prepare them for 21st century careers. His work shows new possibilities of transforming classrooms into creative communities that engage in dynamic collaboration for sustained idea advancement supported by new roles of teachers. And there's certainly some wonderful journal of learning sciences papers that I would highly recommend as outstanding examples of design-based research. Um, so without me taking too much of your time, let's welcome Dr. Zhang Wei Zheng. Thank you, Cindy, for inviting me. And uh, it's great to see you all here. Uh, uh, in the morning, we already had uh, small meetings. I really enjoy the conversation. You have a very strong team and great people to work with. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, Cindy has been you know, we just time fly by so quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, after so many years, I go friends and still see her as my mentor. Oftentimes, uh, not necessarily all academic. I got caught up in the role asking me to be a department chair one day, I got so scared. I said, give Cindy a call, see how, how she survived. I said, okay. <laughs> I moved. <laughs> yeah, then you moved. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to give, uh, you know, my talk will be mostly sharing with you about the recent work I've been doing uh, about how to create uh, knowledge building classrooms, especially how to build the kind of support that can really make this work. Uh, uh, this work is, uh, really a collective work, collective effort with all my uh, graduate student and wonderful collaborating teachers in Albany and also in Toronto. Uh, so still maintaining a collaboration with schools there and is sponsored by uh, National Science Foundation. Uh, so I'm going to start with a brief context, talking about the current, you know, the education uh, change. And then we're going to move to the how to transform classrooms into creative knowledge building communities. And then uh, the core part of the, uh, today, we will be sharing the design strategies to deal with two important challenges about how to support a dynamic student-driven knowledge building process. And then we can have time some, for reflection and for discussion together. Uh, so as the general context, I know that everywhere we go, we're going to see education system are facing a lot of challenges, a lot of problems. And uh, lack of motivation on students, and lack of support for teachers every, everywhere we're here. And um, there are achievement gaps. 
But if you look at all the problem, and there's another kind of problem oftentimes not having received enough attention, which is more about the, uh, the challenge of the future. Are we really having an education system that really fits up to the future challenges that prepare students for their life, for their world, that actually the future is very near? And if you look at the, you know, we, we actually, this is all getting very clear that the workplace and the future society as a whole really require creative work with ideas and with knowledge. That has become essential to not only the economic success, but also the, you know, a democratic society as a whole and personal life to be able to thrive and be happy. And so we really require a citizenship that really be able to do creative work, creative thinking with ideas, with knowledge. It's not only just that demand, there's also a push. Because we look at what's going on in the workplace, it's a lot of the low order basic stuff are being automated, right? And so think about what would be the important role that students need to play in their future life if there are a lot of stuff being automated. And we really need to make sure, work proactively, to make sure that our education system is ready for that future and we are preparing all students, not just a few successful ones and a lot of people put even more disadvantage. So that's the big picture we have here. So when we think about you know, uh, education for creativity for a future, do we have a future? Do we know enough about creativity? Do we know how to put creativity at work in classrooms and in our education system? If you look at the progress in creativity research, I think in the last two decades, major progress has been made. And a few important notions that we can learn from that field can help us think more about what education should look like. Here I highlighted a four important concepts from the uh, creativity literature that's a little bit different from the traditional kind of concept of creativity. One, creativity is for everyone. It's not just for the genius, the gifted, and everyone can be creative. That's an important discovery in the creativity field. And the other is creativity is really not just about groundbreaking you know, big work. It's about every day can be creative, everyday creativity. And in our everyday talk, in our everyday life, in the way we navigate our careers, we use a lot of creative process in, that, in everyday life. And the, the third one is about creativity is not just that critical, mysterious spark of sudden flash of an insight and idea. If you look at a lot of creative aha moment, behind it, oftentimes we see a long thread of continual and incremental idea improvement. If you piece all the mini steps together, that aha moment oftentimes is not so mysterious. It's just naturally got there. And if you know enough about that incremental process. So creativity is not only nurturing that creative aha moment, it's about engaging students in a sustained process of continuously working with ideas and not be satisfied with the continually found problem you need to solve over a long time. And creativity takes a long time, that we, that's what we know. Like, so it's so-called 10 year rule. Do not expect to be able to come to the field and suddenly become a big creator. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, the years of accumulation in that field and to be able to make a, you know, a, a notable uh, contribution. And the last one, very important, is that creativity is oftentimes is collaborative, it's social. It's not just a lonely genius sitting in a quiet corner to reflect and suddenly got something you know, big in your mind. It's a lot of collaborative social interaction going on that help you move. If you look at all those big concepts in the creativity literature, a lot of them, you know, I would say this four, these four all pretty much align with what we know about learning, right? Good learning, deep learning, creative learning, productive learning, as especially that we know in the learning sciences, that's all along this line. So how can we actually build those, you know, a classroom that really embrace this way of working with ideas, with knowledge, with reflection of the new notions of creativity? And this is very important because we know that uh, if you look at globally, the, all the big challenges highlighted by the UN uh, Sustainable Goals, each, this is 17 goals. Um, if you look at the list, poverty, and uh, good education, clean water, sustainability, and global warming, and life on the land, you know, climate change, 
if you look at all the 17 big challenges that you want to identify for humankind, really, <laughs> none of them can be solved by just one nation, just one, one, one group, or one individual, right? We really, we really need to think creatively about how we can actually build our education system to be able to prepare our kids, our students, and to be able to deal with those challenges together. So that's a, you know, the big picture. Oftentimes I care, you know, think a lot about how we actually are doing our work in a way that really helping kids. Uh, not just getting a better score, but really uh, think about you know, their long term. And if you look at coming back to the learning sciences or the education literature in general, what have we learned? One of the most promising model in our education and pedagogy is about increased learning, it's about collaboration, it's about putting students in charge of the learning and do creative work with problems, with challenges, with, with ideas, right? And I use the term not building uh, community mostly based on not, uh, Scott Melia and collaborators work, but really this uh, has a lot in common with other inquiry-based pedagogy in general. So how can we transform classrooms in knowledge building communities that really embrace those important lines of working with ideas and with knowledge? And we know that a knowledge building community, uh, students working together to build collective knowledge, there got to be something collective not just individual or good learning. And that collective knowledge can benefit and leverage every member's knowing, understanding, and inquiry, and personal growth. And they build knowledge through authentic process of knowledge building or knowledge creation. And the students do questioning and come up with theories, good ideas, testing ideas with evidence, design things, improving things over time, and those are what, what uh, you know, our creative teams do on a daily basis, right? And they not only do this individually, but through collaborative knowledge building discourse in a conversation, in a small group, sometimes as a whole class. So making sure the ideas are continually built on each other and unfolding a collective journey. And in doing this, what we see in the classroom, what we feel in the classroom, is really a creative culture that embrace a lot of the social emotional side of changes as well. Willing to take change, uh, risks and embrace challenges and be able to you know, identify what you don't know, not just what you know, and continually go beyond. And willing to kind of embrace the unknown world, right? That's the, the, a lot of the social emotional kind of a thing going on there. And this is, you know, the, just give a sense that the oftentimes we create technology to be able to support the creative process in the classroom. And I want to you know, give you a sense of the kind of classroom setting I typically work with. Oftentimes I feel, especially in the literature, sometimes people would ask, you know, is this knowledge building inquiry, is that all about discovery learning? It's not all about discovery learning, it's much larger than that. Students may do their discovery, but think about how we, how we survive as researchers, right? Do we invent everything we know? We don't. We learn a lot from the peers, from the literature. We read a lot, we write a lot, but something we create, but a lot of things are really building together means learning from each other and from the sources. So in the knowledge building community, we see that the whole wide spectrum of activities that students may engage in, including individual time doing small sketching or reading, and based on what they kind of read about, they may come up with an idea to test things out, actually self-generated experiment, working together, working uh, in small group. And this, they may come to share with the teacher what they just found out, and going to have a very mini session of a small group talk with the teacher, and then look at what, what has been learned, what's the challenges, and then they co-read, they may summarize. Sometimes you see the big kind of dictionary at their desk, because they're a big word, and when their questions really go deep, they really go beyond you know, the grade level kind of reading. And then they come together, the whole class, have a conversation, and then sometimes it's go online. And the online could be, a, you know, a, a, we, we, we use the website called Skype the Scientist a lot. When they ask a good question, and no one, you know, the teacher doesn't have that strong science training, they will post a question to the website called Skype a Scientist. And their the scientists are going to come to participate and connect with the classrooms and give a mini lecture. 
and they 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 uh, share their ideas, their questions, having their uh, live conversation uh, on not a forum. That's uh, the connected piece. So in this kind of environment, there are a few important principles that we see at the core of the classroom process. One is community college, uh, community knowledge, and collective responsibility. So knowledge is not only the personal knowledge that we kind of memorize or try to deepen in our mind. And knowledge is an important social artifact, a social resource that's being created by the community and become the asset of the community. That's basically how, how scientists work, and that's basically how R&D teams work, right? They're not just rewarding what you know, how smart you are, but how you contribute to the collective pattern, right? Knowledge, product, whatever we design together. So knowledge is collective, and we take collective responsibility for that. And I, I use this formula kind of almost like the, the more visualize it a little bit for the teacher and the student. We can put this on the, on the wall to help them understand what's the mean to be working with collective knowledge. Let's do the three moves. The more I contribute, the more we know, and the better everyone learns. So basically make sure everyone is adding to what we know, and making sure what we know is so visible and explicit or uh, transparent to the members. And then making sure everyone is not only just learn what you happen to be interested, but broaden up and be able to build connection with your peers in the related areas. So that's a kind of way to kind of really build the community. The other uh, important principle I want to highlight here, because that has to do with what we're going to talk about for the challenges, is the epistemic agency. So in this kind of a classroom and in any creative setting, an important change is that you have to be willing to pull the control of the work to the people who are really doing the work. And you cannot expect that the, the team is going to be so productive and creative just by following a very smart, creative leader. And you just have that collective culture that really value diverse ideas and allowing the different members to kind of twist the idea in different way and not following the command of the, of the leader. And that's the collective kind of a, a environment that really embrace creative culture, creative processes. So in the classroom, it's important for us to really give students that opportunity to enact high-level agency. The agency is reflected as their, uh, opt uh, their control, responsibility, for charting the process of a sustained inquiry to continually go beyond what we know and deal with new challenges. I use this video. So it's basically like, as I work on something, and research something, the more I know, the more I realize I need to know. There are always new things that are coming out as I engage. And the, because I realize there are new things that need to be investigated or need to be researched, I need to organize my time and shape my social environment, which is peers, groups, and classroom time, then to be able to have the opportunity to do that. So this is really kind of creating the kind of leverage for organizing, continually organizing, reorganizing the classroom process because of what they realize that they need to know. One of the example, uh, you know, in my work, uh, in, the, in, the, in the light study, grade four, when the young kids were uh, researching light, and a lot of fascinating phenomena about light, and one of the things is about the big rainbow, right? And they look at the rainbow, how are rainbows created? That's the question coming from the student. So they would do research and do experiment, and they read, and they realize that the big rainbow in the sky is not colorful chemicals floating around after rain. It's simply because the light, the light spectrum, it's the tiny raindrop split the light, casting out that different colors. You know, that's a, big, that's a good answer to the, to the science question. That's basically consistent with the textbook. But the student would continue their line of thinking by generating deeper questions. They ask, why, the why are the colors in rainbow always in that same order? Mm -hmm. That's a powerful question. Mm -hmm. Now, it has to do with the light, the light spectrum, right? So it's not just about splitting the color. It's also about what's in the light. Mm -hmm. 
So why is that always in that order? Why is all that in semicircle? I don't even have a good question for that. <laughs> good answer for that. So they will create a kind of moment for them to be able to continually trigger their deeper wandering, and as a, a result of their wandering, they would spend their time to pursue that research. It's not like, okay, you can learn that in middle school, but you really allow students to go in that area. The other good example I have is about like a kindergarten teacher working with kids, w working on like plants and trees. And then look at trees, what, what's a tree? An invisible part, the invisible part with the root, and what make up a tree, and why, what's the function of a leaf, of other things. And one question, once kids start to say, I think trees have lungs. The teacher you know, was drawing on the board, drawing tree branches, roots, and leaves, but when the student was saying, I think trees have lungs, the teacher was really stuck there, and waiting, almost like say, want to say like, trees don't have lungs. But then instead, the teacher say, oh, that's interesting. Where do I put the lungs? You know, that's an interesting way. Trees do not have lungs that we have, but trees have their own lungs, which is for breathing, right? So that question or that idea spark a big conversation, follows through that whole process. It's like, how do trees stay alive? Do they, do they breathe? How do they breathe? So that actually, you know, it's a very childish kind of way of saying things, but it created a large opportunity for, uh, for the uh, whole research process. And we have to allow the classroom process to be reorganized because of the student deep interest and, and questions. So, we, uh, in the last few years, the early work I, uh, I did was mostly looking at how the classroom collaboration was reorganized as a result of student like interest and deep, deepening thinking. And what kind of collaboration structure would really support that? We began with more fixed small group kind of structure. So each, each small group would do the, you know, the different kind of topical areas. You do shadow, I do color, you do different material. So, and in, we all share along the way, but each of us do our own mini talk and share online. And this is a social network analysis coming out of that kind of collaboration structure. It's very scattered, different small groups. Each click, you see that this is which student build on which student idea in the four months period. You see that each dot is a student, and you clearly see the small clicks in the social network, and the different students working with their peers, but they only connect through the center figure, which is the teacher. Uh, the teacher have to coordinate a lot between the different small groups and different members. So this is uh, the kind of most teacher, even it's inquiry based, but it's quite teacher coordinated in a lot of ways. And we gradually moved, that was the year one model. We did the, uh, uh, the, the different model in year two and all the way to year three, also do the same unit, but with a more opportunistic dynamic collaboration, which is the small groups being broken down along the way uh, when they really come with a different question, different interest. They previously work on something with three peers, but they realize what they are asking is not what they know. Mm -hmm. They need, really need to connect with a different group in order to know wh what's going on. For example, when they work on why the lenses actually help us, you know, the nearsighted people. What's going on in the nearsighted? That's a different people who are different, you know, group of kids who are working on mostly about the vision and how we see things. And this group of kids are mostly working on lenses, you know, concave and convex, and they don't know what's in the eyes, right? So they have to kind of start to break up their conversation and to build the new collaboration structure. So this is what we see when we really allow students to go beyond their groups and uh, uh, continue their conversation collaboration uh, based on what they need. So this we see the teacher is really more kind of towards uh, the peripheral kind of a line. Still kind of important, of course, but you see the dynamic process. And we have content analysis to look at what they learn. The dynamic collaboration really not only lead to better collaboration process, but also deeper learning, because they are able to connect the different ideas uh, across the topical areas. So that's uh, you know, mostly the work I did in the first, like, 2007 to 2009, 10, uh, in that time period. So after that, I was the last 10 years, 
10 years, well, uh, we really struggle with the challenge about, okay, that classroom is fantastic. That's a very great teacher to work with. But can we implement this kind of a teaching at a broader scale? What will happen if we bring it to a new classroom, a different teacher, a different group of kids? Not just do one unit, but whole school year long. And how, what, what's the challenges that we're going to face? And how do we deal with those challenges? We know that in CSL uh, kind of models in general really face the challenge of implementation and scalability. How can we sustain it? How can we scale it? So I'm looking at the challenge uh, you know, the, of uh, uh, the sustainability in general, but I want to narrow down to two things. One, it's about how we can sustain this more dynamic way of doing knowledge building inquiry over a longer term. And so in each classroom, how we can build that longer term profile or journey uh, in a way that really engages student high level agency. And by long term, it's not just the matter of covering more content curriculum. It's about giving the student ideas a longer life. If you know we highlighted the importance of doing creativity, creativity doesn't come, come in a spark of moment, right? You have to be able to continually engage in your thinking. And sometimes you kind of almost move away from it, but then you come back, right? So you have to allow that enough time span for the creative work to be able to spread. And so how we can actually build that longer time trajectory for sustaining the uh, process in each classroom? The second is about how can we actually enable a larger scale information flow or idea interaction beyond the classroom so students can build on their ideas from another classroom or build on an idea from a different school year even, either from their own work or from a different classroom. Who have, you know, every year the same curriculum, right? Same teacher doing the teaching, basically follow the same curriculum topic but every year they have almost like start from scratch again. <laughs> so can we make the collaborative work, the resources that generated a really some, something that students can continue to build on? So those are the things I've been working on. And the idea, you know, those two challenges, I'm gonna give you the, just my answer, and then we can talk about the details, uh, is uh, the recent project I work on for the Ideas Red Mapper project. So in this whole project, I basically align like two or three major ideas uh, to deal with those two challenges. So how to sustain longer time trajectory in a way that really engage student control, student agency. And I use a concept called reflective structuration. I'm gonna come, come to it for detail. And it's basically about how we engage students to co-organize their journey. Not so much prescripted, prescribed, but really engage the case input to build that journey. The second challenge is about how to build uh, the kind of uh, uh, enabled cross-community interaction or sharing of ideas. I'm uh, mostly talking about the concept of boundary crossing. How we can make student idea a boundary product that whichever classroom context that idea happened to come from can be transferred, can be kind of shared with another community and become an interesting resource. And for both, we try to build a kind of analytics and visualization that can support it. Uh, so I want to give you a, a classroom video, just give you a sense, the kind of work that students do. You know, also give you, relax a little bit so you don't over <laughs> Mi Hua Chen is my uh, computer scientist collaborator. So you see in their classroom there are a lot of readings and there is a curriculum standard. And they, they talk about what they want to know, sitting together <coughs> as a circle. And then they post their <coughs> individual ideas on the I, I, not, not form is interconnected with uh, ideas red marker. So they post what they know, what they're wondering about.
And then as they post, they can reflect on the big questions, big ideas, what they are interested in. So organize the collective focus. And then they use that as a way to organize their classroom process. They, they do experiment, so oftentimes based on what they need to figure out. And a lot of the time, the small talk is all pro improvisational, not pre-planned, but happen to be something interesting going on, they quickly put, put together. There's some modeling, kind of hands-on stuff going on. We don't have a very strong support for that. I'm talking to, I was talking to Joshua about that part. This is about human body system. So a lot of kind of flow between the different settings. So they not only talk about what they know, but what they need to know. And sometimes they just draw on paper. And collectively, they use the online space, but they have also have a, a big wall in their hallway. So they use it really well. They post, you know, for the four classroom in the same building, they kind of share a lot of stuff just in, in, the, in the hallway. So those artifacts really create a kind of a connection between the different uh, classrooms. Also create the kind of interest and energy. So they really want to talk to someone who is in a different, different room. Yeah, just give you, give you a taste of the classroom environment. So, Before, before I uh, you know, move to the two challenges, do we have any like, uh, questions at this point? Any short ones? And keep like, a longer discussion uh, at the end. Are you with me? Yes. Yeah? <laughs> Good. OK. Cindy, are you keeping me, uh, help me keep time? Oh, yes. Oh. Yes. You have 15 more minutes to talk, and then we've got questions. Okay. So let me share with you the, at the more detailed level of the two challenges. Uh, I'm going to give you, you know, how I, how I got those and, uh, like, uh, the, uh, the key idea, especially the uh, structuration part, which is an article I published last year, in, uh, two years ago, in Journal of Learning Sciences. Uh, but the, the conceptual part is actually a lot of uh, maybe, maybe abstract, uh, hard to the desk. So I'm going to spend a lot of time on the reflective structuration, how to build a longer term um, dynamic knowledge building in each classroom, and I'm going to quickly show you the result of the other uh, studies. So when we think about how we build a unit, build an inquiry program, a process that lasts, let's like, say, four months, three months, sometimes even longer, and a lot of time, we rely on the teacher, the designer, to put in place some kind of structure that begin with a topic, begin with a task, and followed by a few kind of steps for students to do, like, like, like product-based learning, right? There is a product, there are some component, there are resources attached to it, and there is a ways to eventually come together, share what you find. So a lot of component in terms of what we need to do and how we're going to do it, who are we doing what, have been structured a lot. So structure is important. We need to guide that process so it's not just chaos. But on the other hand, we know that for this kind of classroom to really work well, it's so important to engage student agency. So they are really taking high level responsibility for the ever deepening process, deepening journey, that oftentimes cannot be prescriptive. Right? Because you, the teacher never can imagine that the, the kindergarten uh, kids, the trees have lawns. So that's the kind of uh, uh, a student agency that's really play out, shaping how students are going to learn, what they're going to learn, and how they're going to work together. Uh, so oftentimes, that creates the kind of tension for designers and for practitioners. That's an old tension. It's not new. So 
we still do this kind of a scripted uh, inquiry, uh, basic kind of process for design a lot. Uh, we need to look at the curriculum, look at what, what need to be learned, how they learn, and then students are going to follow or somehow use our structure to engage in the process. And then we have the scripted collaboration kind of approach in the CSL literature for years. So their minimum guided inquiry doesn't work. That was years. <laughs> and then we have scripted <laughs> collaboration. And then as we do the scripted collaboration, then we run into the risk of over scripting. Over scripting means giving students so little opportunity for them to actually kind of take control and do creative work. So is there a right amount? Is there some kind of balance we can keep in between? That has been years of research. I know that almost like a no forever, like a no answer kind of question. So in the last few years, uh, you know, instead of asking like a whole, what's the right amount of balance between structure and agency, I more take a kind of a genetic almost view into the uh, structure itself. So what kind of structure are in classroom? Not just how much, but what kind? Is there a kind of a new structure in classroom? Actually, they're not limiting student res uh, responsibility, but actually empowering their engagement and agency. What would that look like? As I search for the kind of a structure, I look broadly in the different field. For example, one of the lines of work is the uh, co complex science, right? Complex systems. If you look at social life, and a lot of structures are around us, shaping our participation, our attention, on how we behave and how we talk, interact. And the, when you go to a park, you're gonna see there are plan paths, right? We kind of, uh, the designer create this blueprint, expecting people to be walking here, right? And then, even there are very well paved paths, but you always see this, right? So that's the so-called, the desire line, the social trail. And it formed, and as people kind of walk there, it just makes sense. And even sometimes you see the, this kind of a sign, you know, no stepping on the grass, but you know, uh, oftentimes that doesn't work. <laughs> and so this represents the kind of a dynamic in our social structure. There is something planned, there is something emergent. And the emergent paths oftentimes are more powerful than the pre-planned. And that create the kind of, that has led to the new ways of designing social spaces, so-called emergent design. So instead of pre-set up the blueprint and just let the construction workers to build it up, so the designer would purposefully just create the general layout of a public space. And you're gonna see the parking lot, you're gonna see some buildings, but then there are wide open spaces, just leave it open for a while and wait for the small trails to come out a little bit. So you'll follow their kind of a footprint, not necessarily going to pave everything, but you can select the pave, right? Eventually there will be things paved, so there are going to be roads and guiding people traffic, but that's built on what people has left in this public space. So this is basically the kind of interest I have for me to view into the classroom life and look at what kind of structures are more like pre-planned kind of paths. And are there anything emergent? Are there anything like not pre-planned? So uh, <clears throat> this is like a several study, look at several different classrooms, grade four, grade five, and grade six mostly. And we do like very detailed recording of their daily process. What happened, what's visible in the classroom. We do teacher interview, and we uh, analyze the teacher's uh, reflection journal, look at what they did. What they did. So we look at what kind of structure are there, how are the structure introduced, sorry, typo, and formed, by whom, is that by teacher, is that by student, and how are the structure actually used and evolved. So I'm going to give you, you know, a lot of the kind of a tedious work, just uh, mining the data, a lot of qualitative stuff, and tracing and rebuilding the history, and look at when they have a, a piece like a guidance, so was that the first time it was mentioned or that something already happened before? I want to just give you the kind of, a, you know, the quick answer to our, our, our research is that what we identify is that in the kind of a very student-centered classroom, uh, like the uh, grade four life study, 
the teacher actually are playing an important role. And, but it's interesting that the teacher's role of guidance is not always directly just come from the teacher, but it's a way for the teacher to kind of find something like a little seeds in the classroom already and kind of highlight it so that everyone starts to attend to it, become a topical area, or become a kind of a direction to pursue. So we call this co-constructed structures instead of pre-planned structures. You know, it's simple. So let, a lot of time, they do their conversation, share their ideas, do their inquiry, in small group, in collective, but they're not all just talking about their content, but talking about the, at the meta level, I call meta talk. So they're talking about, what are we talking about? What are we interested in? Why are we talking about this stuff? And how can we do this if, they, if we really care about this? So you see that the kind of question they talk about, that's the metacognitive level, almost like a teacher lesson plan kind of question. What are we learning? Why are we learning this? Why is it important? And who will be doing what in order to get this learning done? And how do we know if the learning has happened, right? The learn, the basically, those are the, the kind of lesson planning kind of question. So they talk about this at the metacognitive level a lot of time embedded in their regular conversation, sometimes even devote like 20 minutes, just talk almost totally at the metacognitive level. So this is not just meta talk, but the meta talk actually give rise to some artifacts that represent structures. So as a result, talking about what they are researching, they kind of, okay, all the small questions generated by the different kids, they kind of have a little sticker there. They realize, okay, this is really about how we breathe and why we breathe. That's really about the heart and why the heart keeps beating. And this is really about what's in the blood. So you see the big kind of areas of wandering or directions of inquiry start to be shaped as a result of the individual interests coming together, becoming connected. And you see the big kind of stars adding there, the smaller mini questions are more individual, and then there are individual names being attached to the wall and become an organizer for the next couple of weeks. This is going to be keep shifting. They can still add an, the immune system, but actually was added later. You see, that's why it ended up in the corner. And in the beginning, they didn't have anything about the immune system at all. So you see that gradually new questions pop up, and they're going to add a, you know, another circle, but that's become a classroom life kind of organizer. Mm -hmm. And this is not pre-planned. It's just no definite teacher would expect something like this, but not exactly going to know what it look like. So that's the kind of a collective classroom artifacts that really representing the structure of collaboration. And that can be bring, brought back to the classroom process to inform individual participation, what I'm doing, why I'm doing this, how I'm going to connect what I know with others, and the cl collaborative talk. And the same kind of structure the teacher use is to keep track of student participation. You know, a lot of the kind of low tech stuff is like having a, this is on the wall, a big branch of questions, and then the student names in the column, and then everyone's kind of moving a little, uh, a little magnet, and to say, today I'm working on this mostly, and you can shift. So everyone has a magnet, but you're moving a name between the collective space and be able to know who are working with you in the same area, right? And you can see each student may have sometimes have more. You see the, the big areas work and how that's becoming an organizer. So this is just to give you a sense, the so-called like co-constructed structure. Uh, what I would want to say is that this co-constructed structure is more than metacognition. It's because this is fundamentally social and is system level. It's beyond any individual mind. It's a collective artifacts coming out of the interaction but becoming an organizer just like the, the, the desire lines. Mm -hmm. Once they are paved, it's a road, right? It's not just your interest, it's called desire line, but it's not just desire, it's left forming a line. That's a collective emergent, uh, like a system uh, property. So I call this process reflective structuration. Is that the process by which members of a community co-construct collective increased structure over time 
to channel personal and collective actions as a dynamic system of knowledge practice. What I mean here is that the teacher can really begin with a minimal level of this. You still do lesson planning, but do, do kind of a less. And you leave a lot of wide open space, almost like the, the park designer. Right? You want to leave a wide open space in terms of what exactly you're going to do, but do not plan out so much like all in detail. And as students engage in the process to conduct inquiry and talk about stuff, share their interests and ideas, they can come back to revisit what we have as our collective kind of framing of what we do, how we're going to do research, who we'll be doing what, who is going to be collaborating with whom, the small group part. So that's basically a simple version of that uh, collective structure. I, I use this structuration, the word, uh, mostly based on the uh, sociology kind of literature. If you know like uh, Archer's work, Giddens work, those are basically the kind of sociology. What, the, what, what, I've, what I learned from the sociology literature about this kind of structure is that this is the kind of social structure that do not simply constrain agency, but actually enable human agency. If you know like how a powerful person who can make an impact, make a difference in social life, it has, that person has to know how to navigate, work with existing structure in order to change it. That's basically the kind of agency that a person can play out. If you never play the game, you're not going to change the game. <laughs> That's the basic thing, right? You have, if you want to change the game, how are you going to play? You have to be willing to learn the game and play with it, but you change the rule. That's the game changer. Uh, so the structure is like that. So the kind of social structure that really empower agency, uh, not just not just uh, uh, constraint or uh, undermine agency. So I try to play the, with this concept more and uh, create the, uh, a technology platform called Ideas Frame Mapper. Can I give you a few uh, screenshots? And so in the general conversation space, like in another form, more visual conversation, or some other platform, MOOC, like a more linear conversation. If you look at the current collaboration design, you see a lot of good tools for interacting idea responses, or uh, sometimes posting. And, but what you don't see often, and very hard to see, is the meta-layer emergent structures. Like, if you see a whole bunch of them now like this, what are they talking about? Who are talking about what? What's the potential direction that's emerging? And Though that metal layer emerging structure is very opaque in this kind of a layout. So instead of just that conversational space, I created the idea thread mapper. It's basically one function is adding a metal layer for emerging structures. So you may still have your detailed conversation going on, but coming up to a metal level, what are we talking about? So those are the branches we add to the visualization and almost like the low-tech version of that big poster, right? Mm -hmm. So as you see that, that's really, ground, really grounded in the teacher's work. So they can come here to add a branch, right-click, add a new branch, of each branch become a conversational space. That's the organizer for the, uh, at the meta level. And a student can right-click any area to either sign up for a ma other major contributor. I'm interested in how the digestives work. So your name will be added in there. You're going to see who are your peers mostly interested in it. And you can shift, you can change. And we can record how they, how they change in the different areas. And each area become a conversational space mapped out along two dimensions. So the, each dot is a, is a post. A line is a response. And the post in each area of conversation is mapped out along timeline. You see this is beginning from January and the last all the way to almost end of April about how the brain work in the grade five human body system in grade. And the work relay, you see the different student names. So basically a teacher can intuitively see what's going on over time. More intensive conversation in the beginning, quiet down a little bit, and then coming to the later phase. 
and which students seem to be adding a lot. Any, any like area uh, correspond to the student name is the area of adding by that student. Uh, and then across all the areas, you're actually going to see in the different areas conversation, the, the color shade doesn't show much here. But you see the color shade in, across the different areas of a human body system, how have the conversation been moving along uh, over time? Some of them start very early. This, these few areas, thread two and three, those are very early areas. Where other areas, thread one and four, it's very pretty late. And then you even see the vertical lines. Some of the ideas are connected, even though they're talking about different things. Talking about breathing and talking about blood. So that's the kind of process we, we have gone through. It's really kind of a, I think it gave you a, a, some kind of result in the, in the classroom. Uh, so with this layer of uh, student-driven classroom support, generating their own ways of structuring their inquiry. How does that help? So we kind of do the uh, design experiment in two grade five classrooms. One, just do knowledge form without this tool. The other knowledge form uh, with this tool. And then we look at how the different classrooms work out with a lot of quali qualitative data. But then here is just uh, some easy kind of quantitative stuff. You see that the conversation pattern with this high-level reflection, it becoming deeper in terms of asking better uh, questions and better explaining things, explanation gen generation, and use of evidence, and integrating, applying like a different idea from different areas, and coming together as a whole. Hmm. Uh, <coughs> and then we also look at their uh, level of ideas. Uh, you know, it's, uh, see the visible changes in their ideas because the way of talking, way of organizing, their talk tend to be uh, deeper uh, in terms of the scientific stuff. And then this is how the conversation is connected. It's, you don't just talk about topic for itself. When you talk about how the hard work, it's always come to, to the breathing, right? You always come to digestion. So how many times are you building connection between different topic areas? This is a different unit for, for, for electricity, which is another unit, but very similar. You see, with this reflection, the conversation tends to be more connected and getting deeper. So uh, I just want to maybe end with a slide from the second, second thread, the second challenge, uh, which is about how to build this one? How to build a cross-classroom kind of a collaboration, and then we, we don't have time to talk detail. If you are interested later, we can we can uh, we can share. So, other than having each classroom having long time idea build on, and driven by their interests and the agency, the other line of work I've been doing with my student uh, is. Look at how we can possibly enable the idea connection build on even across different classrooms when they are working on the same curriculum, human body system, let's say. And the current ways of doing the kind of online collaboration are mostly within the different spaces. You have your discussion area space. I have my discussion space. You log in, you go to your room, right? You don't see what's going on in the other room. So teacher did the kind of trial, like, okay, let's share our space. So you see mine, I see yours. And then there are a lot of some excitement there, but it's very hard to do because students need to double the amount of notes they need to read. And it's also, all, it's the note do not always make sense to them because they are not part of that classroom process. They don't know why they're talking about that stuff. So what we tried out is like adding another layer above the different classroom conversation space we call cross community discourse space, which is for a macro level kind of a sharing for an uh, idea to uh, flow between different ideas. Uh, I'm going to give you this as an example. So each classroom has their own way of organizing their questions. But there is one branch. It's called super talk across different classrooms. If you have a big idea, a big question, that your classroom simply feel like too difficult to, to, to uh, kind of investigate. 
if you add any topic under this branch, that question is going to be available to all the other classroom and become a shared discussion space. So, so a part of the conversation is shared between different classrooms. One example is like the human body system, they talk about a different body system, but grade fifth graders, one of the interesting questions they generated was how do we grow? That's a kind of a very important age when they start to kind of grow so fast, right? Mm -hmm. And how do we grow? And in this basic kind of science textbook, you don't easily find that kind of answer. Mm -hmm. Because that has to do with all the body system. It's not just one body system thing. Mm -hmm. And so when one classroom starts to ask this question, the teacher talk to the other teacher and decide to let's share this as a whole kind of four classroom work together area. Mm -hmm. So they post this as one area called how people grow. And the four students from four classrooms start to add their ideas. And this is really putting together ideas about genetics. What's really control the, the hormone? And then the, the hormone control. And then the idea about muscle, cells, and about like, uh, the uh, puberty. So you see the, the different ideas coming from the different body system start to come together in one big talk. So this is actually creating a lot of interesting kind of uh, opportunity for how the students from different rooms start to meet with each other. So each student, each color, is uh, 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 represents members from a different room. So you see, kind of start to see, because of the, uh, uh, the cross-classroom interaction, how the ideas are flowing. So I want, I want to end there, and then we can uh, have uh, some conversation. Thank you. when you get to the data. Um, so let me open this up for probably the, the, um, a little more than five minutes of questions, but John Way will be at lunch and we still have lab group meetings in the afternoon. So questions? Yumi? Hey there, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I'm really excited and interested in this idea of desire lines, mm -hmm. and I wonder if you can talk a bit more about what you see as the poss future possibilities for this idea, but also potential, um, I guess, concerns or downfalls of yeah. um, following desire lines. I, you know, I look at this graph a lot. Uh, just think about what this really tells us. Um, I think this has this concept has a lot to do, definitely, for when we think about uh, like a collaborative environment, when the process, the space, is highly interactive, and highly interactive means is unpredictable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, things cannot be fully uh, predicted, therefore cannot be just prescribed. And so for that kind of design, this gives us a lot of insight. But as we work on this, it also has to do with other uh, ability areas. For training teachers to be able to work on lesson planning and so-called instructional design, and we really need to kind of think about the possible ways to shift that mindset of a design to not just fully plan out a whole lesson, well sequenced, and even from the very beginning, you know exactly how you're going to assess it, right? That's basically the prescriptive kind of a back, backward design. Is you know exactly where you should end. And this is not. This is oftentimes you do not exactly know where you're going to end. You have a direction, but you do not exactly where. So think about how the process of designing can be somehow grounded bottom up and engaging the, uh, the input from the participant as a goal, things can come out. Good teachers do that all the time. And expert teachers are never going to be prescripting their teaching, just deliver it year after year, right? Mm -hmm. so that's what we know. And, but this gives us a, a way to kind of understand that uh, process. The other uh, important lines of thinking I have, you know, that's you know, for design for inquiry, design, uh, uh, working with teachers on lesson planning or instructional design, and the other line uh, of work I'm be doing is think about uh, learning analytics. A lot of learning analytics are somehow guided by predefined criteria. And this will be kind of a help us to rethink, to really follow through what students are pursuing mm -hmm. instead of what the designer or the instructor are pursuing. And we have to build the analytics in response to what they care about. If they say, in this area, my, I identify as an expert in, in the uh, digestive system, but I also want to know more about that. 
you need to kind of almost have the analytics tracer for each student based on what they, what role they play in this whole collective space, and then go from there. So think about how the analytics will be more bottom up instead of all top down. Uh, assessment design is another big thing. How we can assess student if every student are, is kind of a learning stuff based on their self-identified goals. And their goal, we got to have a common knowledge, but then it's not everyone know exactly the same. How we got to create be responsive to that diversity in the learning process, but still be able to play out the function of assessment, which is look at where we are going and be able to find that, find the kind of a gap, the moment when we need to adjust, right? The ongoing process of uh, assessment. So, you no, know, a lot, lot of stuff. The organizational science have played it with this concept a lot. That has to do with leadership and organization of education. Education cannot be that all hierarchical. That's you know, not, not, nothing new. I feel like that's just another layer of things uh, applying the, in the kind of desire line. I think we have time for one more question. And then John will be at lunch and other meetings. Hungry. Everyone's hungry. Hungry, tired. Well, <laughs> we can go have pizza then yeah. and talk at lunch. So, right this way. So, John, we thank you. Thank you. Thank you very well.